same day, Simba, the sun will set on my time here and will rise with you as the new king. In this alone, Thank me, everything. everything the light touches. So this is part six continued. Again, this is part six continued, which will be the continuation of the first part of part six and of course part five. So we're picking up where we left off in the first half of part six. So needless to say, if you haven't seen part five and part six, make sure you see those segments before viewing this particular segment right here. And the reason we're splitting up certain segments is of course due to the length of the video being more than two hours. So what you're gonna see is we're gonna be cutting up or cutting our videos in half throughout the rest of our series from time to time. So we're gonna pick up where we left off in part six, the first half, the first part of part six. So of course, in this particular segment, we're going to be demonstrating and proving our collective identity that has went unchanged since the beginning of civilization. And with that said, we're going to be extensively exploring the book, Afraka, Afraite Kite, the origin of the term Africa, by going into the primary sources from ancient Kemet that contain the origin of the term alongside demonstrating that the name Afaraka could actually still be found in the culture, language, cosmology, and names among the various ethnic groups and clans on the continent of Afaraka, Africa, to this very day. So we're going to read. The myths put forward by the Eurasians seeking to locate the origins of the name Afaraka outside of the continent of Afaraka, Africa, and in the Greek, Latin, Sanskrit, Arabic, Phoenician, and other languages, have been shown in this book to be a deliberate attempt by non-Afarakanu, non-Afarite Kaitnu, non-Africans, non-blacks, to misinform Afarakanu, Afarite Kaitnu, Africans, black people, and dispossess us of our heritage and culture. Continue. This is nothing new. We have been and will continue to be at war culturally, intellectually, spiritually, and physically with the whites and their offspring, their culture, and their pseudo religions, inclusive of all forms of Christianity Islam, Judaism, Hebrewism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, pseudo esotericism, etc., until the whites and their offspring no longer exist. In the world, we will always meet the challenge and will emerge triumphant on every level. Indeed. So as you can see, the Aquamu Nation in North America shares the same sentiments as us. And yes, which everyone should already know by now, we're in a spiritual and psychological warfare as well as a physical warfare with our absolute enemies. These parasitic spirits of disorder who continue to deliberately lie and misrepresent our people, including their Negro agents, who are also helping them perpetuate false information and misinformation on our people to keep us divided and confused. And of course, moving forward, we will also be deconstructing their fictional Israelite myth as it relates to its Afarakan African origins, as well as their New Age pseudo-esoteric occult teachings, so this is what we're also going to be dealing with moving forward. So first and foremost, we're going to start off by dealing with some geological science, which is the science that deals with the Earth's landmass as well as the body of water and ice within it. So we're going to deal with this science to show you its relationship to our ancient Nile Valley cosmology and that our ancient ancestors and ancestresses 
actually taught the same thing, except, except we actually knew and incorporated the deities, the divine forces in nature, responsible for carrying out creation. So this is the difference between the various credible forms of modern science and our people. We actually dealt with the forces in nature, creation, which as we discuss in part five of our series, governs our various ethnic groups and clans while being connected to us by blood. So, the Earth's surface is comprised of approximately 71% water and 29% land mass. Initially, the Earth's surface was completely covered by water. Our Afrikanu, Afrikanu, African ancestresses and ancestors learned the process of the development of the Earth's first landmass and codified this process in their writings and illustrations. They, we, learn of this process directly from the Abosom, the deities, the goddesses and gods, the spirit forces of creation who affected the process itself. So again, which we also expounded on in part five, what is being said here is that we learned of this process directly from the divine forces in creation, nature, the goddesses and gods who affected the process, whom throughout the course of time began to interact with us and tune into us through spirit possession and spirit communication, where they guided and spiritually cultivated us as their children, of course, their only divinely created children, thus teaching us the cosmological processes of creation with respect to the laws that undergirds them so we can carry out our divine functions and purpose in the world as Afrikan Black African people. It is within the ancestral cosmology, language and writing system of ancient Knesset and Kemet, ancient Black civilizations of Nubia and Egypt, that we find this process codified and named with terms that are over 40 thousand years old so again as you can see this particular date over 40,000 years ago is also noted and mentioned in the book which we highlighted and proved conclusively in part five of our series via the Torin papyrus which we also showed and proved through the modern scientific data when assessed properly also corroborating and substantiating as well Continue. Earthquakes on the ocean floor of the primordial earth caused a portion of the ocean floor to rise up above the surface of the water. This raised land became the first land mass of earth. This raised land became the first land mass of earth. The masculine term for raised land, highland, exalted land, hill, mountain, in the language of Kemet, ancient Egypt, is Ka. The feminine term for the same is Kayet, also written Kat. These terms are often written Ka with the Q and Kayet or Kat also with the Q. The term for soul in ancient Kemet is also Ka. So as you can see, it's very, very important to be taking notes as we're going to need to know and understand all of this fundamental information as we move forward. So we're going to reiterate so we can clearly understand what's going on. So the first landmass of earth, the masculine term for raised land, high land, exalted land, hill and mountain in the language of ancient Kemet is Ka. The feminine term for the same is Kayet, which could also be vocalized as Kat. And the term for divine soul, your soul is also Ka. So as you can see, the T suffix at the end of the term is also being indicated here. Like we talked about in the first half of part six, the first part of part six, dealing with the feminine T suffix that comes at the end of the term in the hieroglyphic language that indicates the feminine or diminutive. So this is what you're also seeing here.
So, what we have in front of us now is two Medutu, two hieroglyphic symbols. The one on the top, the first one, represents the soul, which again is Ka. And it's important to note that the Medut, the symbol that represents the soul, the Ka, is also your divine consciousness as well. Because your soul, as we talked about in part five extensively, is your divine consciousness, your divine intelligence. So we have the second Medut, the hieroglyphic symbol, the one on the bottom, representing the raised land, exalted land, and high land, which is also Ka, written with the Q Medut as well. So as you can see, the symbols with their arms up and out in a praised, raised position and posture, which is a very key part of our cosmology to understand when you're dealing with the divinities, the deities, the divine forces in creation and us first receiving them through spirit possession and spirit communication, which is also responsible for giving us our divine function and purpose on earth. So again, we have the term Ka for soul, a symbol with its two arms up in a raise and praising position. And we also have the term Ka, which also means high land, exalted land, and raised land, which you can see is the symbol of a man also praising with his arms up and reaching out. So some of you probably already noticed in the first part of part six, how certain terms in our ancestral language of Kemet actually have not just one, but multiple meanings, which you could see also in this example here, which of course the same is true today, given that our languages today are also direct descendants of ancient Kemet and Kanit, which is Nubia. However, what you'll notice is because these terms and names were rooted in our ancient Nile Valley cosmology, language, and culture, you always find that even though on the surface they may seem to have different meanings, there's always still some form of conceptual, cosmological, spiritual, and or cultural relatedness to these words. So the Ka meaning the soul, the divine consciousness, and also meaning the first raised land, high land, and exalted land, is also the very reason why the English words soil and soul are still somewhat conceptually and fundamentally connected as well. Because we always knew as Afarakan people that the soul is the root part, the root essence of our being, which root in the physical environment is the soil, the land we come from, the land we were created on, as we emerge from out of its vibrant soil at the beginning of creation. Continue. So now you're looking at the Kamadut hieroglyph, which again represents the soul, but also your divine consciousness. So here we have the actual Ka symbol side by side next to the earthly form of the Ka. Again, Kayet, Kat is feminine, which is a symbol of a mountain, hill, mound, raised land. So you can see the Ka symbol with its arms raised has practically the same form as the earthly Ka. Also, of course, exemplifying the concept of as above, so below in the true sense. Now, what's also key here is in the image on the left, you can see that the sun is actually rising over the mountain, mound, hill, which in the cosmology of ancient Kemet and Kanit, ancient Nubian Egypt, is actually a depiction of the first sunrise in creation. So as you can see, this holy mountain, which again is the earthly Ka, also received the divine living spiritual energy of Ra, Raat, who's not the sun god and sun goddess, but the actual creator and creatress. 
Therefore, ra, rat, ra, rat actually uses the sun as a physical transmitter of their spiritual energy. So the sun is the actual shrine of Ra and Rayat, as they gave birth to and animate the sun, as well as other stars in creation. So Ra and Rayat are the divine living energy animating and moving throughout all divinely created entities in creation. So again, as you can see, just as the exalted high land, the first raised land, again called Ka, masculine, Kat, Kat, feminine, received the divine spiritual energies of the sun as it rose for the first time in creation. So did we, and so do we, as children of the sun, the children of Ra and Rat, received, and of course still receives, Ra and Rat's divine living spiritual energies as the only divinely created children of Ra and Rat, the children of the sun, sun kissed, blessed with this melanin. Continue. So above are also three versions of the name Ra. The second version is simply the depiction of the Aten, which is the sun. This is because when you see the Aten, you see Ra, for Ra operates within and through the Aten, which is the sun. So the Aten is the actual sun god and Atenit is the sun goddess. So Ra, Rat, operates within and through the Aten, which is the sun. Continue. So also here we have above three versions of the name Rat, Rat. The second version is the depiction of the Aten along with the Medut hieroglyph underneath it that resembles a half circle, which you can see right there on the right. This Madut is for the letter T. In ancient Kemet, the letter T is used to indicate the feminine or diminutive. Thus, Ra is masculine while Rat is feminine. Amen is masculine while Amenet is feminine. This linguistic device was co-opted by the whites and their offspring and continues to be used today. So the feminine or diminutive forms of names in European languages bear this out. Anton, masculine, Antoinette, feminine, Paul and Paulette, Jean and Jeanette, cigar and its diminutive, cigarette, etc. So this was co-opted by the Eurasians into the English language. Just like every other thing, they corrupt and co-opt our writing scripts, royal titles, divine titles, names, etc. So after invading ancient Kemet, they co-opted a number of things that they decided to take into their dying culture, their diseased spirit of disorder culture.
Continue. The two arms representing the Ka are the same two arms of the individual who's reaching upward in the Madut for Ka, highland. The term Ka is also defined in the language of Kemet as the land above the banks of the river, the high ground upon which the deity of creation first stood. And of course, the deity of creation being spoken of in this particular context is Ra and Rat. So again, see part five, where we elaborated in detail the difference between the Creator and Creatress, Ra, Rat, and the Supreme Being, Amen, Amenet. The term is also doubled, Kaka. So the term Ka, meaning highland, is also doubled, Kaka with the Q or Kaka with the K. The doubling concept is widespread in Afrakani, Afrite Kaitni languages when a particular quality or attribute is being emphasized. So we extensively discuss the doubling emphasis in the first half, the first part of part six. So here he's also talking about the doubling emphasis concept, the doubling emphasis concept, which is widespread in Afrakani, Afrite Kaitni languages. So you see the ancient Kemetu term, Kaka, also have the Dublin emphasis. So the Dublin emphasis is widespread in Afrakani, Afrite Kaitni languages when a particular quality or attribute is being emphasized. The term Ka with the Q also has the variation Ki with the Q, Ki with the K, or Ke with the Q, Ke with the K in the language of Kemet. Continue. In the Chui language of the Akan people of Ghana, the term Kaka is defined as hill, raised land. This is the Kaka of ancient Kemet. So you could see the term Kaka in ancient Kemet with the doubling duplication concept was also retained and carried over in the Akan language of Ghana as Kaka with the same meanings. In Akan cosmology, the area called Kaka Afra, Afra Kaka, is defined as the region where the great ancestress and her family settled after having descended from the sky heaven on a golden chain after the beginning of the world. So in Akan cosmology, the area called, written in their language today from left to right, Kaka Afra, actually derives cosmologically from the ancient origin of the term Afra Kaka, which is actually a variation from ancient Kemet, Afra Ka, with the Dublin emphasis concept. So in Akan cosmology, the area called Kaka Afra, or rather Afra Kaka, is defined as the region where the great ancestress and her family settled after the beginning of the world, after the beginning of creation. So this great ancestress being spoken of in the Akan cosmology is actually speaking of the divine matrilineal inheritance that will later determine the ancient divine kingship that was birthed from the womb of our ancient Nile Valley Queen Mothers as the first government on earth was established over 40,000 years ago. So again, this is why they called it the divine dynasties in the Torrent Papyrus because those divine dynasties were born of the ancient goddesses and gods of divine spirit forces in creation who established civilization divinely sanctioned by the Supreme Being through us as their children. Continue. In the language of the Yoruba people of Nigeria, the term Oke is defined as mountain hill. This is the Ki with the Q or Ke 
of Kemet. There are five sacred hills in Yoruba cosmology, one of them being Oke Ara, which is defined as the hill upon which the Orisha, Yoruba fideities, first descended to create the world. In this Yoruba term, Orisha, which is sometimes vocalized and pronounced as Orisa, meaning deities, is also important to note because we're going to be dealing with this later on as well. Continue. The terms ka, ka, ka and ake, ke, in Kemet, Akan, and Yoruba all refer to a raised land and also a sacred raised land associated with the foundation of the world. So again, you can see the ke in Yoruba and the ka, ka in Akan, deriving from the ancient Kemetu terms ka and ka, ka with the double and duplication concept, meaning highland, exalted land, hill, raised land, retained in both the Akan and Yoruba language with the same meanings cosmologically and linguistically. Of course, referencing the foundation or beginning of the world. The same is true of many Afro-Akani, Afro-Akaitni languages all over the continent, for they are all derived from the ancient languages of Knesset and Kemet, ancient Nubia and Egypt. We are the same people. Indeed. Continue. The term af in the language of Kemet means flesh as well as house, chamber in the language of ancient Kemet. Flesh and house are conceptually related because your flesh is a house, a place of residence for your spirit. The plural af is afu. In the Chuya Khan language, the term for home, house, is afe or afi, plural afi. The term afin is the Yoruba term for palace. Af, afe, afi, and afin in Kemet, Akan, and Yoruba are all genetically related, phonetically related, and conceptually related. So once again, you're seeing that the terms af in ancient Kemet. Afe, Afi, and Afin in the Akan and Yoruba language are all cognate terms, which means they are related. They have a genetic affinity to each other. Continue. Moreover, the tree term Afa is defined as a carcass of an animal, that which is discarded and taken up once more. The O in afa is a nasal O. When pronounced nasally, the term afa sounds virtually identical to afu. The tree term afa describes animal flesh carcass. So this is key. This is critical for our discussion. For when Ra moves through matter, matter becomes the house or place of residence, the flesh of the creator. This is why in ancient Kemet, the title of Ra when he moves through matter is Afru-Ra. The creator as Afru-Ra takes on the form, flesh, of a ram. And the title of Ra, Afru-Ra, which again is when Ra is moving, penetrating through matter, flesh, house, taking on the form or flesh of a ram. We're going to be explaining the cosmology and its other associations in a little bit as well. Continue. So it is important to note that the name Afra or Afra exists in the language of the Akan, a major Abosom god deity worship in Akan culture is the Abosom name Afram. The feminine version of the name in Akan culture is Afra. So the deity Afra, which again is the title of Ra, moving through matter, flesh, house land in ancient Kemet also still exists in modern Akan culture as Afra and Afram. And suffice to say, the title of the divinity Ra, moving through matter, flesh, house, land as Afra, also retained in modern Akan culture as Afra and Afram, is actually what the Eurasians partially corrupted and co-opted 
to manufacture the fictional Israelite character and tribe, Aphram or Ephraim. Yes, their fictional his story is based on nothing but corrupted fragments of our ancient Nile Valley cosmology of actual names, functions, and titles of divinities, deities, forces in nature who they carnalized to make a his story for themselves because of course they didn't have any corrupted names, titles, and functions of divinities in creation who still governs and animates different aspects of creation as well as our various clans throughout the world. However, to stay on track, we're going to further deconstruct the biblical fictional character Aphram, Ephraim later on as well. So we're going to stay on track with where we are now and deal with that later. Moreover, it was stated before that in Akan cosmology, the area where a certain ancestress settled with her people after having descended from heaven on a golden chain is the region now called Kaka Afra, which you're going to see in a little bit is actually Afra Kaka, deriving from the ancient origin of the term Afra Kaka in ancient Kemet. Again, Kaka means hill, raised land in Chuya Khan and in Kemet, Kaka. Afra is a term in Chuya Khan meaning fertile land, farmland, land that is vibrant. Continue. The pronunciation of Afra in Chuya Khan, depending on the dialect, sounds like and is often written Afra. Thus, Kaka Afra is a reference to a land of origins. A fertile Afra, highland, Kaka. Kaka Afra is Afra Kaka, Afra Ka, Afra Ka. So you could see the actual origin of the term Afra Ka so-called Africa was actually preserved and retained in the Akan language cosmologically and phonetically which we're going to show you the actual primary source in ancient Kemet where this particular variation of the term actually derives from. So the reason why the land is fertile is because the energy of Ra and Ra'at is circulating through it, making it vibrant and full of life. Today, the name Kaka Afra has been contracted to Kakafu, a well-known region of Ghana. So they actually took the name with them and it's actually a region today in Ghana. And with that said, what we have in front of us here is one of the primary sources from ancient Kemet that contains the origin of the term name Afraka Africa. So this particular primary source is a portion from the Runu Per M Heru, which the Eurasians call the Egyptian Book of the Dead. So what we have in front of us is the actual Runu Per M Heru, the Papyrus of Ani version, chapter 17 on plate 7, which essentially is a text speaking of how Ra, the creator of the world, rose up for the first time above the surface of the water to establish the first landmass of earth at the beginning of creation. So we're going to first read in our ancient ancestral Kemetu language and then read the English translations. Ra pu um shai kaif um nesut hin hin um nesut um un un kapur suth shu afra kaka un ami kamenu nuk un toro a. Which translates Ra, it is in beginning, rose he within hin hin nesut as king, sovereignty within existence, not coming to being. Pillars of Shu existed he upon highland hill of that within inner Kemenu. I am God, great. So as you could see, 
it was Ra in the beginning who rose within in his suit as king, sovereign within existence, who rose upon his highland, Afrakaka, Afraka. So as you can see, the continent of Afraka, what they now call Africa, is the first raised land, the highland that emerged from the ocean floor, from the primordial waters of earth. Afraka, the land, the highland where our sun rose for the first time in creation. So this is one of the actual primary texts from ancient Kemet that contained the origin of the term and name Africa, which you can see now in the modern Akan Chui language was also retained and preserved as Kaka Afra or rather Afra Kaka, which also in their cosmology speaks of the region on earth where their great ancestress settled after descending from the sky heaven on a golden chain after the beginning of creation. Back in the book, Afraka, Afrite Kite, the origin of the term Africa. So we're going to continue to break down the origin of the term Africa because the term and name is multi-layered in meaning. It's multi-layered because it's rooted in our ancient cosmology that goes back tens of thousands of years that has a lot of nuances to its meanings and references. So again, the term af in the language of Kemet means flesh as well as house, chamber in the language of Kemet. Flesh and house are conceptually related because your flesh is a house, a place of residence for your spirit. The plural af is afu. In the Chuya Khan language, the term for home, house is afe, or afi, which plural is afi. The term afin is the Yoruba term for palace. Af, afi, afi, and afin, and kemet, akan, and Yoruba are all genetically related, phonetically related, and conceptually related. Moreover, the Chuya Khan term afo is defined as a carcass of an animal that which is discarded 
and taken up once more. The O in a fa is a nasal O. When pronounced nasally, the term a fa sounds virtually identical to a fu. The Chuya Khan term a fu describes animal flesh carcass. So this is critical for our discussion. For when Ra moves through matter, matter becomes the house or place of residence, the flesh of the creator. This is why in ancient Kemet, the title of Ra when he moves through matter is Afra. The creator as Afra takes on the form, flesh of a ram. So like we said a little while ago, we're going to be dealing with this title of Ra, Afra, when is when Ra is moving through matter, flesh, house, which is also land. So we're going to be dealing with this as him taking on the form, flesh of a ram. Now, the figure you're looking at here is an actual depiction of Ra in his solar or sun bark. Because again, in the cosmology of ancient Kemet, Ra operates through the Aten, which again is the sun. So Ra is not the sun god. The Aten is the actual sun god, while the Atenit or Atent is the sun goddess. So again, the cosmology of ancient Kemet, Ra rising his sun bark across the sky from horizon to horizon, from sunrise to sunset. He then travels in his bark for 12 hours of the night through the spirit realm or underworld. After his underworld journey, the solar bark emerges from the underworld on the eastern horizon as the new sunrise and the beginning of a new day. As the solar light, the energy of Ra moves into the underworld inside the earth at sunset, the earth becomes the flesh, house, place of residence for the solar light of Ra. So the figure again is a depiction of Ra in his solar bark. And notice how the Aten, the sun, is on his head and in front of him. So again, this is essentially speaking of how the creator Ra sails the Aten, the sun, through the sky from eastern horizon to the western horizon. The solar bark dips below the western horizon and sails from the western horizon to the eastern horizon underground, thus bringing light to the underworld during the 12 hours of the night. So as you can see, this is an actual cyclical process that our ancient ancestresses and ancestors were speaking about, which of course still happens to this very day. Because we're talking about cosmology based on how the divine forces, the deities, the goddesses and gods operates and moves throughout creation. So this is what we're talking about, which is cyclical. So what you're looking at now is the actual depiction of the creator Ra as Afura, which again is the title of Ra when he descends into and penetrates matter, thus taking on the form, flesh of a ram. So this is a depiction of Ra as Afra when he takes on the form, flesh of a ram-headed divinity. So here we have the Medut, the hieroglyphs of the ancient Kemetu term Af, which plural is Afu, which as you can see 
is translated to mean and references the carcass of the sun god of night or the dead body of Ra, which is why in its derivative in the modern Chui Akan language, the term Afo also means a carcass of an animal, that which is discarded and taken up once more. So you can see Ra has the form of a ram-headed god, divinity, and his shrine is encircled by the serpent Mehen. So as you can see, cosmologically, which was also expounded on by Brother Jirafo in part five of our series, that Afra is when Ra moves through matter, he takes on the form flesh of a ram, which also actually took place at the beginning of creation when Ra's solar energy penetrated the first landmass of Earth. The Ka of Afra, Afra Ka, which of course is what you find corrupted in their Bible in the fictional Jesus or Yeshua story of the so-called sacrificial lamb. And of course, the so-called sacrificial lamb is nothing but a sheep, which is a corruption of the ram of Afra moving through matter, flesh, house, land. Yes. This was all corrupted and stolen from our ancient Nile Valley cosmology. The whole story about the fictional Yeshua or Jesus being the so-called firstborn, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end, the Son of God, the head of Israel or the head of the church is purely corrupted fragments. Let's repeat, corrupted fragments lifted from our ancient texts dealing with the cosmological foundation of the world and civilization. But not only that, this is also why in Western astrology, which of course is another Greek dilution and perversion of our ancient Nile Valley cosmology, they teach that Aries is the first zodiac sign, whose symbol is also the ram, who rules what they call the first house, with the first house set to represent the head or beginning in Western astrology, which also deals with the sun ascending or rising on the eastern horizon during the time of one's birth. This is also why some Christians to this day will argue and debate that so-called Jesus or Yeshua was born during the spring, which of course is around the same period of the vernal equinox, when the sun enters the zodiac sign of Aries, which again, symbol is the ram, also considered to be the first zodiac sign. <laughs>
But not only that, the Eurasians to this very day still use a general term for sheep. They call ovis aries, which means ram and sheep in Indo-European languages, respectively. Of course, the Bible is nothing but the Greco-Roman exoteric corrupted fragments of our ancient Nile Valley cosmology, with Western astrology being the New Age pseudo-esoteric side of the same coin, which is also Greek in origin. The same Greco-Romans who wrote the Bible, the same Greco-Romans who invaded our ancient Nile Valley civilizations, which we also had established through expansion through West Asia, the so-called Near East. Needless to say, so-called Jesus or Yeshua is a fictional character that never existed of any race whatsoever. He was not black, he was not so-called Middle Eastern, and he was not white. It's Ra who's the firstborn of the primordial waters, which are the waves of creation. It's Ra's face is what we see in the sky, heavens, whose symbol is the Aten, the sun. It's Ra's fire and light energy who gave rise to the first landmass of Earth from our Earth Mother's ocean floor, the Ka of Afra, the exalted highland, the raised land, the primordial hill, mountain, the primordial mound, which is his throne, your highness, Afra Ka, whose divine throne was later inherited by the god Heru through his father Asar, through his queen mother Aset, who gave birth to her sons to rule the world in ancient Khan, Kanit, Kana, the Ka of Afura, the Khan of Afura, the divine soul, the divine land, Afura Kanu, Afura Kaitnu, the first people the firstborn, the divinely created, the only begotten, the heir to the divine kingship on earth. Having said all of that, now we're going to continue with our breakdown of the origin of the term Afarakha, Afarite Kite, Africa. So, when Ra and Rat first moved through the primordial hill, the Ka Kayat to make it vibrant, to give it life, the Ka Kayat, the raised land, became the house or place of residence for Ra and Rat. It is for this reason that Ra and Rat take on the titles Afra and Afrat. This is why the first landmass is called the Ka of Afra, the land of the Creator, and the Kayat of Afrat, the land of the Creatress. Continue. So the Ka of Afra is Afra Ka. The Kayat of Afarat is Afarite Kayat. Afaraka Afarite Kayat is the divine land. Geologically, this first emergent landmass is of the continental plate. Afaraka Afarite Kayat. So the landmass, what they now call Africa, is the first emergent landmass of the continental plate. It's the first and original landmass of Earth. So the male title, Afaraka, was corrupted by the whites and their offspring into Africa. So again, what we have here is a depiction that was painted by one of our ancient ancestresses and ancestors of ancient Kemet, which is a depiction from the papyrus of Hengsu Mes showing the primordial mound of creation. So from a bird's eye view, it actually depicts the Ka Kayat 
the high land which first appeared above the surface of the water to become the earth's first landmass. So this Ka Kayat is actually described in many texts of ancient Kemet as the primordial mound of creation in the region of Kemenu or the Kaka of Kemenu, later called Hermopolis by the Greeks. Continue. So again, we have here in ancient Kemet, Kaka, with the doubling duplication, referencing Highland. And you also have in ancient Kemet, Ka, of course, referencing Highland, land. So in the modern Chuya Khan language, we have Kaka, hill, mountain, Highland. And you also have Kwa, farm, fertile land. In the modern Chui Akan language. So you can see these terms are all related because the Akan language, of course, is a direct descendant from the language of ancient Kemet and Kanit, which is Nubia. Continue. So now we're back in the Papyrus of Ani, a reproduction in facsimile, volume one. A hymn to Amen Ra. And again, the god Amen is the male half of the supreme being, and Ra is the creator. So Amen Ra is actually a title of Amen when operating and working together with Ra in creation and civilization. So, to give a modern example of this, and this is only an example to give you an idea what we're talking about. This is why in Western astrology, which again is another Greek dilution and perversion of our ancient Nile Valley cosmology, they'll say similar things like the planet Saturn is in Aries. Remember again, Aries symbol is also the ram. However, the difference is in our ancient Nile Valley cosmology and civilization, we actually dealt directly with these divinities these forces in nature through spirit possession and spirit communication. So this is how we learn of their function and movement through our creation. So just like their Abrahamic religions, they had to find a way to politically demonize the deities, the forces in nature, because it's only our people and our people only that they communicate with and possess. So our Eurasian enemies had to create these false religions and their pseudo new age sciences with them being the representation and gods of, which is exactly why they manufactured their false one God, Jesus, Allah, Yahweh, so that they could be the state representations on earth of. So that was all political on their part to get us away from dealing directly with the divine forces in creation nature who governs and animates our respective ethnic groups and clans throughout the world. So this is why they had to manufacture their monotheistic Abrahamic religions with them being a representation of the false gods of on earth. So that's how they get you to worship them and do all kinds of things politically to you at the expense of your own ancestral divine culture practices and inheritance your resources that which makes you a divine being with a divine function and purpose in the world as an afrakani afrite kitney black african person however in this particular hymn to amen ra we're going to read to further show you how the eurasians corrupted fragments of our ancient texts from ancient Kemet to piece together their fictional biblical narrative about the beginning of creation. King of the South and North, Ra, who word is truth 
the governor of the world, the mighty one of valor, the Lord of terror, the chief king who made the world as he made himself. Adorations be to you, O maker of the gods, who has stretched out the heavens and founded the earth. So also, Ra being the king of the south and north is actually what they corrupted in their Bible as the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Ephraim, so-called Ephraim, which we also mentioned in previous segments is actually referencing Upper and Lower Egypt. Upper and Lower Kemet with Upper Egypt, Upper Kemet, originally beginning deep into the south and east and southeast Africa, Africa, in the regions of modern day Sudan, Ethiopia, Uganda, Kenya, etc. So that's the original beginning of so called Upper Egypt which we're going to deal with later on in our series extensively as well. So this is where they're manufacturing this concept of a southern kingdom of Judah and northern kingdom of Ephraim. So again, it was Ra in the beginning who rose as chief king, sovereignty within existence, who made the world as he made himself, who has stretched out the heavens and founded the earth. So now we're in their Bible, in the book of Isaiah. So we're going to show you now where they actually corrupted and co-opted these ideas and concepts about creation they have in their fictional biblical account. Thus saith the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out. He that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. So that's in Isaiah chapter 42, verse five. So again, we have in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 12. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens and all of their hosts I have commanded all of their hosts which is actually referencing all of the gods or Elohim, all of the so-called angels, the army he have commanded. So you could see clearly from the papyrus of Ani, the hymn to Amin Ra, we just read how the creator Ra also stretched out the heavens and made the gods and the earth. So you can see that they corrupted fragments of this portion of our ancient text, damn near word for word. Continue. So we're back again in the fictional Bible. So we're going to read again in the book of Isaiah. Chapter 41, verse 4. Who has performed this and carried it out, calling forth the generations from the beginning? Question. I, the Lord, the first and the last, I am he. And also in the book of Revelations. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So you can see where they get in these concepts and ideas from to manufacture the narrative in their Bible, the fictional narrative talking about their creation. So now we know where they're getting these ideas from alongside their esoteric pseudo new age sciences like Western astrology, etc. It's all connected because again, the Bible is the exoteric Corrupted fragments of our ancient Nile Valley cosmology. Meanwhile, Western astrology and the other New Age pseudo occult esoteric sciences are the esoteric corrupted fragments of our ancient Nile Valley cosmology. All done in efforts to demonize and take away the primacy of the goddesses and gods of creation and civilization. 
who gave birth to us as their children. Of course, they're only divinely created children and only begotten, hence the firstborn. So you can see the fictional God in the Bible talking about the beginning and him being the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega. Of course, this is also a corruption from the Papyrus of Ani version of the Runu Per Emheru we read earlier. Which we should also add that within the context of that particular text, which again you can see here, was actually a question and answer formula. Just like in Isaiah chapter 41 verse 4, so in our text was actually a question and answer formula also, which was actually a part of the format of the text. And in that question and answer formula, the divinity identifies himself as Ra, who rose up for the first time within the Aten, the sun, at the beginning of creation, upon his highland, Afrakaka, Afraka. That said, what we're going to do now is show you our other primary texts from ancient Kemet that contain the origin of the term Afraka, Africa. So what we have here is the Shat M Tuat, the book of the underworld, spirit world. And the underworld or spirit world is just another way of saying the ancestral realm. So in the Shat M Tuat, the book of the underworld spirit world, we find another variation of the origin of the term Afrakant. So we're going to read Afrakaka and Afrakant are directly related. As the Obosom, the divinity Afrakant, African is a protector of Afra. As the boat of Afra passes through the underworld during the 12 hours of the night. The Afrakant, which again is a divinity also, is a protector of Afra. Afrakant has also been transliterated as Afrakant. Afrakant is a name just as Afrakaka is a name. Afrakant. So you can see to exist also he upon his highland, which is also talking about the cosmology of the creator Ra. So what we're going to do now from this point going forward is get into this particular variation of the origin of the term Afraka, Africa, which again is found as Afrakant in the Shat M Chuwat, the book of the underworld, spirit world. So what we're going to demonstrate is that this particular variation is the actual Khan of Afra, as in Afrakan, Afrakanu, the people of Afraka which will be equivalent to African and Africans in English. Continue. The word Kant or Kand, transliterated Kant, Kand, Kent or Kend, with the determinative of a terrace hill slope, sometimes called the staircase, is once again a word referencing a highland and also throne. So the determinative that he's speaking of here is actually a descriptive symbol that comes at the end of the term in the ancient Medutu, in the hieroglyphic writing of ancient Kemet. So the determinative is actually how we're able to tell what particular context a particular word is actually being used in. So, for example, the English word bat, 
B-A-T, could either be an animal or it could be a baseball bat, also spelled B-A-T. Both are spelled B-A-T, however, both refer to two totally different things. So in ancient Kemet, the determinative medut was the descriptive symbol that came at the end of the term to indicate what particular context, a term that's vocalized and transliterated the same way, is being used in. So basically any term that's vocalized and spelled the same way, the determinative medut is what is used to indicate what's being talked about and what context the term is being used in. So the word kant or kand, transliterated kant, kand, kent or kend, with the determinative of a terracil slash slope, sometimes called a staircase, is once again a word referencing a highland and also throne. The highland or terrace slope kant is a variation of the straight slope elevation in its relation to highland ka or kat. The terrace kant is the throne of he who dwells upon it. This is related to the straight ka, highland being an earth throne upon which ra, rat, first sat as a culmination of the process of raising and establishing the first landmass of Earth. The term Kant is also a term referencing the first land as we will see in the next section. So now we're gonna deal with this ancient term, Kant with the feminine T of Khan, which is also sometimes transliterated as Kent, Kand, or Kend, which you're gonna see now, not only references the throne, highland, but also the first land and first people, the Khan of Afra, Afra Kanu, Afraite Kaitnu, the first, the only divinely created, hence the first born. Now, what we have here on our left is a dictionary of the Asante and Fanti language called Chui. And again, the Asante and Fanti, also vocalized Ashanti, makes up the larger ethnic group called the Akan people, who are predominantly located today in West Africa, Africa, in the country of modern day Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast. So on our right, we also have an Egyptian hieroglyphic dictionary, volume one. So now we're going to further demonstrate that the Akan people, as well as others on the continent, have preserved and retained these ancient Kemetu terms in their culture, cosmology, language, and names. So again, like we discussed in the first part, the first half of part six, in ancient Kemet, the vowels were typically excluded by our scribes. So therefore, in the field of Egyptology today, the Egyptologists will arbitrarily insert an E between consonants to facilitate the proper vocalization and pronunciation of words. So the E they inserted was merely a guess where sometimes the E they inserted was correct and sometimes it was not. So the term kan, kant with the feminine T in ancient Kemet was actually written as K-H-N and K-H-N-T without the vowels. However, because we still speak this ancient ancestral language and for example, the terms still exist in the modern Chui Akan expression of our ancestral language with the same meanings. We know and have the proper vowel placements and vocalizations. Which you can see here, 
the proper vocalization in the Akan language is Kan with the A, which forms the root of the name Akan in Akani. So, the first form of the ancient term you see on the top right is not vocalized kanti. It's actually vocalized kani in the Chui Akan language. So, the term is vocalized kani from the ancient ancestral kometu root kan, also written with the feminine t. So we're going to read Akani, a man of Akan descent, a man speaking the Akan or Chui language. Kan, the first, foremost, place, rank, or time. Kan, the first, to go before, formally, previously. Kan, above all things, first of all, a long time ago, which is actually referencing the beginning. So, what you're looking at now is the actual extension of the definition of the root term kan in the Chui Akan language and dictionary. So, this is the actual extension of the root kan, which you could see here in its compounded form, specifically references the very first, the beginning, which of course is speaking of a long, long time ago. Now, what's very, very important to understand here is that this ancient term kan, kant, kanit, with the feminine t, is not just a term speaking about the Akan people as we know them today, but is an actual ancient designation that originally referenced all of our people as the first, foremost people, those from the beginning, the foremost, the head, chief leader, the children of Afra and Afraat, Afra Kanu, Afraat Kaitnut. So we just want to make it clear that this is not just an ancient term for the Akan people as we know them today, but it's an actual collective ancient designation that originally referenced all of our people collectively. The firstborn, the only divinely created, the only begotten. So you can see also that the origin of our people is the actual land south of Kemet, so-called Egypt. The first land, the front land the land of former times, the land of the beginning, the land our people originated before some of us migrated down the Nile and found a colony of what later became known as the state, the nation state of Kemet, the black land, the black nation.
So here again, we have more forms of our ancient ancestral root term Kan, whom now you could see is speaking of the actual first people collectively as Nubians from the ancient Sudan, as the land south of Kemet, the first land, the front land. The land where our ancestors were in former times before they migrated into and founded the colony and state of ancient Kemet. So notice how on the left also, you could see us designated as the Kanichu people. Remember, as we mentioned in the first part of part six, the U at the end of a term in our ancestral language denotes plurality. Thank you. 